All right, good morning everyone. Dr. Randall Gates, board certified chiropractic neurologist, also a chiropractic physician at Gates Way to Health. We're doing a Facebook Live today on POTS. I'm joined by my dear friend, Kathy. Kathy's on the phone right here. And give us a shout that you can hear us well and that the audio is clear. Good morning, everybody. Yes, indeed. So, Kathy, do you want to kind of take it from here? I have stuff drawn on the whiteboard. Uh, pardon me, wishes well, I was a, a much better artist. I'm not. <laughs> but I hope this is all, You have other strengths to make up for that. <laughs> I guess so. Yeah. Well, today we're going to recap POTS pretty, pretty tightly here to give everybody a really good overview. We talked about it a couple of times before. So we're talking about it again. Why? We're talking about it again because I felt that that first video we did was good. And then I added some pieces on about estrogen. I was also added on about the vagus nerve. And I thought it'd be good if we just kind of bring it all together for someone who doesn't know a lot about POTS, but they've just been diagnosed with it so they can really understand their condition. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me why it's so important to your practice? It's so important to our practice because we deal with a lot of chronically ill patients. A lot of the patients coming to Gatesway to Health have chronic fatigue, which can be a cardinal symptom of patients with POTS. Also, they can have dizziness, or they may have gastrointestinal problems and brain fog. Nobody's been able to figure out why they have those symptoms, and POTS may very well be one of the factors contributing to why they don't feel so well. Okay. Yeah. So that that was a whole bunch of stuff. So our next question was, what causes pops? It sounds like it's a a multi pronged attack. It really is, and I didn't draw those up here, and I wish I would have. I'll just write them really quick: viral infections, stomach infections, like GI infections, so like the stomach flu, skin infections. Let's just say immunizations sometimes have been shown or associated with the development of POTS, concussions, and stress. These are the main factors that seem to cause the body to start turning on itself, creating immune cells to so these different pathways I've drawn out up here that then dysregulate blood pressure and cause the brain not to get enough blood flow and the associated symptoms of being fatigued or dizzy, lightheaded, and then the other things that we'll talk about as well. So. Okay. So how do hormones affect POTS? Oh boy, so how do hormones affect POTS? That's very interesting. Hormones affect POTS by affecting aldosterone. So. When estrogen levels are their lowest, aldosterone levels are thought to be low as well. And when aldosterone is low, blood volume tends to be low, which will What's cause aldosterone? people, what'd you say? What's aldosterone? Aldosterone is a chemical from the kidneys. And I think with me drawing this up here, Kathy, I'm just gonna kind of go through some of the physiology of this so patients you know, and loved ones can understand. And good morning to everybody okay. who's joining. So when you stand up, your inner ear gets a barrage of signals. Most of you have a concept that the inner ear affects balance. Well, the balance part of the inner ear is always trying to sense if you're moving up or down or sideways, things of that nature. When you stand up, your inner ear is in part responsible for getting blood pressure up to your brain, as well as the fact that when you stand up, blood pressure tends to drop, and in your carotid sinus, you have little baroreceptors, as they're termed that send signals to your brainstem, that then send signals down your spinal cord, trying to get the blood flow back up to your brain. That's how it works. What, why this is so important for concussion patients is that lots of times patients who have a concussion will damage this part of the brain, it's at the bottom of the brain, it's called the cerebellum, and the cerebellum won't necessarily filter the inner ear activity as well. And that can lead to a drop of blood pressure when people are getting up and standing around. It's referred to as dysautonomia. So that's something to consider if you have had a concussion or a trauma to your head, and then all of a sudden you start feeling dizzy and lightheaded and things of that nature. Now, going on, what we talked about two weekends ago is this relay loop from the spinal cord to the heart, as well as down here to the legs. 
So when you stand up, I said the blood pressure tends to drop. It can go down into the legs, and your body has to try to get the blood from your legs up to your heart. Well, this propensity for the blood to be down here in POTS, researchers have shown that the immune system is making little missiles to this relay station. It's called the sympathetic chain ganglia. And so the signals from your spinal cord are just not quite getting to the heart to tell the heart to beat harder and contract harder. Also, they're showing that you have little adrenaline receptors on your heart and POTS patients develop immune cells to them as well. So hopefully now you can kind of see, okay, well, if the immune system is attacking these nerve pathways, then that can lead to somebody feeling dizzy because then they're going to stand up, their blood pressures are going to be low, and as a result, then, their adrenal glands, which you can see over here, will actually produce excessive adrenaline, which then causes their heart rate to speed up, and the heart rate speeds up, and they start to feel a little more faint and not so hot. Going farther, aldosterone patients have been found to have antibodies to this thing called the angiotensin II receptor. And so angiotensin II forms, let's think if you like, have the unfortunate circumstance where you cut an artery and you're bleeding out. Well, the blood that's draining out of your body will signal your kidney because pressure will go down in the kidney to release something called renin, which causes the liver to convert angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1, then the lung converts angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. Well, angiotensin 2 causes your adrenal glands to release aldosterone. So now we're at that point, Kathy, where we can go through that. So now the adrenal glands release aldosterone, and the aldosterone comes back to the kidneys. I mean, it's really kind of right there, but in my drawing, the aldosterone comes back to the kidney and is telling the kidney to save sodium. We want sodium to be higher in the bloodstream so that we can have more blood volume. That's blood pressure regulation. So with POTS patients, there are several factors that are dysregulated all the way through these pathways. And that's why so many of you who have POTS are not having a lot of fun because you're just so fatigued when you're up and moving around. You have associated gastrointestinal problems, less times the muscles ache, on and on and on and on. So I hope that made sense. You guys can give me some feedback if it did or if it didn't. I see we have some healthcare professionals watching and, and good morning to everybody. But, um, but yeah, let me, let me know if that made sense or not. So, Kathy, what do we have next? Well, the next uh, question was, how does the vagus nerve affect POTS? Did we cover all of that? Not really. The vagus nerve, just so all of you know, has its main nuclei in the brainstem. And it talks to many organs throughout our body, including the liver, as well as the spleen, particularly the spleen. What's very interesting is that with a lot of POTS patients, because it is an autoimmune illness, the immune system is out of control. It's attacking our own bodies. There's a lot of inflammation. Furthermore, adrenaline from your adrenal glands, adrenaline, promotes inflammation in the body. And that goes back to a lot of the other videos Kathy and I have done about stress, the negative effects of stress on systemic health, chronic disease, chronic illnesses. Well, adrenaline promotes inflammation. However, the vagus nerve is trying to suppress inflammation by directly talking to the spleen and immune cells in the spleen that shut off the inflammation. So that's how the vagus nerve is important in this, Kathy, because they're finding that there's this dysregulated vagal regulation of the spleen and other parts of the body and this shift towards the fight-flight response state of too much adrenaline, trying to get the blood flow up to the brain further causing more inflammation because adrenaline promotes inflammation. So, okay. mm -hmm. so what are the medical options for these patients? Medical options for these patients largely include taking medications that try to save more fluid at the level of the kidney or getting the sympathetic nervous system to fire better um, or to try and block the adrenaline receptors even more to cause more regulation of the heart. So they use beta blockers. Uh, alpha and beta blockers like labetalol, uh, the drugs that work on the kidneys to save sodium, or drugs like fludrocortisone. Uh, commonly, POTS patients are recommended to wear compression stockings, 
uh, and to get exercise. But the problem is for a lot of POTS patients is that they're told to exercise and you know, they don't feel well enough to stand up and walk around. So it's they're, very they're too tired, they're worn out, they don't they don't mm -hmm. have the energy to stand up and do that even if they can without being dizzy or Right. Right, exactly. And we have a question. Good morning, everybody. We have a question. How do we get our doctors to believe and test us for POTS when we know we have it? That's a good question, Rhonda. And in essence, uh, that's a toughie. I mean, I've literally talked to patients, and we had somebody discoursing, I think, before, where you know they talked to their doctor, they talked to their cardiologist, and they didn't even know what POTS was. Now, as I said in that video, cardiologists are really responsible for making sure nothing catastrophic is going on, that there's nothing majorly wrong with your heart, so they're there to save your life. And commonly, they're dealing with very unhealthy hearts, and then they see somebody who's seemingly very healthy, because POTS has a predisposition for females, and lots of times they're younger females. So a younger female walks in the office complaining of heart racing and heart palpitations, and they're not taken seriously. And that's what a lot of our patients um, basically relay to us about this issue. So I would say, how do we get your doctors to be aware of it? I would just say, hey, go through all the testing with me, do an EKG. If you need me to wear a halter monitor, I'll do it, but if that's negative, I really want a tilt table test. And if you insist on a tilt table test, in my experience, usually they'll eventually end up doing it. So that's my take on that. Okay, for the folks that haven't watched the other Facebook lives that we've done on this, what's the acronym stand for, P-O-T-S? Oh uh, yeah, Postural Orthostatic Tachycardia Syndrome. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So they need to have that idea. You just don't go into the doctor's office and say, I got POTS. And he's like, well, what the heck's that? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. And, and I had not heard of it until you brought this up. And mm -hmm. I've dealt with a lot of people who are who have chronic illness. The thing that slays me about all of these things that you talk about, and while you're going through all this because we talk concussion, we talk in, um, inoculations, we talk viral infection, all these things that are totally unrelated that can cause this kind of autoimmune response mm -hmm. that people see. And mm -hmm. I really urge your listeners, uh, I mean, I know there's a lot of the Facebook people that you've been working with that maybe haven't taken the opportunity to go onto the website and listen to your podcast from the radio show. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because in the last year, you have drawn such a map of what happens to all of us as individuals. And... All of these autoimmune diseases, when we talk about them, they just seem like cousins to me. They're all so related <laughs> that um, I think people really need to get a handle on what that's doing. And when we say, oh, Dr. Gate, he treats the body as a whole, uh, <laughs> some people look at you like, oh, okay, what, what do you think other doctors do? Don't you think they're doing right. that? Well, those doctors are treating that symptom. And what went through my head was, I don't know if you watched it as a young kid, as hee haw. Uh -huh. And the old guy would come in and say, hey, doc, it hurts when I do this. And, of course, the answer was, well, then don't do that. <laughs> uh, so right. I feel like a lot of times right. that's the way our patients feel when they come away from the normal medical model is they've gone in and say, okay, I have these symptoms. And so just like you said, we're using beta blockers. We're using all these different things to treat that individual symptom. And sometimes it's not one medication, it's two medications, it's five medications mm -hmm. to try to put these things right, whereas if you're looking at the body as a whole the way you do, um, sometimes we're not using any prescription medications and we're, we're, we're going to the root source of the problem and eliminating the problem, not band-aiding it. Right, right, and that's, and that's where, what I, yeah, go ahead. Well, oh, that's just what I want your listeners to understand is that you have the ability to do that. And I, I assume with the following that you have on Facebook, these people are, are figuring it out that these answers are there. And like I said, the, this autoimmune thing in the cousin situation, it just really blows my mind that all this stuff is so related between your brain, your gut, um, your blood flow clear to your feet, and how that interacts from, from top to bottom. And you're one of the few people that I know of that can actually tie all that together. Well, I really appreciate you saying that, Kathy, and that means a lot. And what I would say is... Well, I, I think our listeners, I, I just really, if, if they haven't gone back to the podcast and the radio shows to tie together with these, then I really urge them to do so because 
I, you've pretty much painted the whole story in the last year of everything that you're, you're dealing with. And I know every day, like you said this morning, you did more research because there is more research coming out all the time. And it's so important that for you, I mean, that's your deal to stay right. on top of it to see what else is out there. So I applaud you for that. Oh, thank you. Well, yeah, I was a little, one of my intentions of doing this video was to dig deeper and see if I could figure out exactly what the antigen is for these different antibodies, whether it's to the, referred to as a G couple to see the choline receptor or the alpha or beta subunits of the adrenaline receptors. Well, we don't know that yet. But as Kathy is saying, there's this, these nebulous cousins of autoimmunity, and there's so much discussion now about Hashimoto's. There's so much discussion about Hashimoto's, and certainly Hashimoto's is real. Kathy and I have talked about it at length. We've gone through the details of Hashimoto's and what leads to it, but there's just this exploding incidence of autoimmune diseases, particularly seeming to affect females. Hashimoto's has a much greater female per preponderance around, I think, 10 to 1. And then uh, POTS, as I mentioned in the other video, 94% of POTS patients are thought to be female. And a significant percentage, depending on the research study you look at, have Hashimoto's. So a significant percentage of POTS patients have Hashimoto's. Uh, another decent percentage have lupus. Other percentages have uh, Sjogren's syndrome, where the immune system attacks the lacrimal ducts and the salivary ducts and things of that nature. So it just seems like there's this mess of autoimmunity. And the more we learn, the more we realize, as we've talked in other broadcasts, that autoimmunity relates to the gut. It seems to relate to these things that Kathy mentioned, like the infections, traumas to the body. And somehow, and for whatever reason, maybe it's the changes in foods, maybe it's the changes in our stressors here in contemporary society, that our immune system turns on us. It turns on us. And that is where we look at people's foods because foods can be associated with Hashimoto's. We're now seeing that foods can break down the gastrointestinal tract, which I didn't draw up here, but I keep pointing up there like it is. So foods can break down your GI tract. We're now knowing that lupus comes from bacteria in your, in your intestines. That was shown this summer. We now know that rheumatoid arthritis has a huge component of either mouth, gut, or urinary bacteria causing it if you're not a smoker. And we're gonna have lab testing that's really gonna be able to decipher whether somebody has RA because they smoke or if they have RA because they have a mouth infection. That's not far away. So that is what's going on. The human body's breaking down, leading to our immune systems attacking us when we get a viral infection, a skin infection, a stomach flu, a concussion, a major stressor, things of that nature. And Kathy, we have another question. Can POTS cause blood counts to raise two years after two concussions and subdural hematoma? Removal was diagnosed with polycythemia vera, but I'm not Jack too positive. Um, can POTS cause polycythemia vera? I haven't seen that. I would think it's something else going on um, without evaluating your case, but I'd say in general, I have not seen polycythemia in my POTS patients, but that's a great question. So I'm, I'm glad that was asked. Do we have anything else, Kathy, that we wanted to go through? Well, next we needed to check how you approach the POTS patient. What do you do? I really, first we take the detailed history and we try to decipher, okay, did this person have a head injury? Did, do they have abnormal processing in their cerebellum? Is there something like that going on that would have damaged the brain's ability to dampen inner ear activity? That's number one. And this is a piece that a lot of POTS patients have missed because everybody now is kind of aware that POTS is out there. They're aware that POTS has an autoimmune component, but not a lot of people are looking at the brain. So, Kathy, as you know, we're doing specialized types of brain imaging. We do a long neurological exam and we put patients through this detailed neurology of eye movement examination that tests how their eyes move, which tells us an, an extraordinary amount about their brain. So that's number one. Number two, I start digging into these elements of the history, what was going on immediately before you started getting lightheaded? What was going on before your muscles started aching? What was going on before you started having brain fog? What was going on before your gut went sideways? Those questions. And then from there, we test for other signs of autoimmunity because these tests that, or these, these antibodies that I'm drawing out up here are not commonly clinically available. 
meaning these G-coupled acetylcholine receptor antibodies, you can get those tested at the Mayo Clinic. That's the only place I know where they're really testing for them. And there's still a lot of debate on what's normal and what's not normal. So that's important to know. Adrenaline receptors are not commonly clinically employed, nor are antibodies, I meant adrenaline receptor antibodies, nor antibodies to angiotensin II and the receptor. So we basically look for the signs of autoimmunity, and then we start trying to fix the autoimmunity while trying to get the blood flow regulation back to normalcy while conditioning the heart, while getting the brain to send the right signals down to the legs. And a lot of patients with POTS are now realizing that they have this thing called small fiber peripheral neuropathy, which is where the nerves from the spine that carry signals for blood flow regulation, like down to the leg, may not be working correctly. So lots of times we have to go in and for all intents and purposes, try to stimulate them back to life. So yeah, that's what we do. That's all I've got. That's all you got. <laughs> I think that's our summary. I don't know if we have any more questions. We have one more. It's uh, do you see POTS in your fibromyalgia patients? Unequivocally, yes. Yes, yes, yes. I see it all the time in fibromyalgia patients. A lot of patients who have been diagnosed with Lyme disease think that they have POTS. You may have POTS. Lyme disease has an autoimmune component. Um, but yes, fibromyalgia patients, for sure, I see a lot of POTS uh, overlapping with that. Okay, well, if anybody wants the reference articles that came to generate this topic, let us know. Uh, we're going to put this on YouTube. Any other questions, just message us on Facebook. I'll try to get back to you in the next day or so. Uh, happy Sunday morning, everyone. And I hope you all have a great day. And Kathy, I will talk to you later. Okay, thank you. Okay, you bet. All right, bye. Bye-bye.